Welcome back, historians. In our previous lessons, we've explored Reconstruction and efforts to rebuild the nation after the Civil War. Today, we'll learn about the reasons that Reconstruction wasn't a complete success and the factors that led to its abandonment. President Grant and Congress tried their best to promote civil rights and ensure equality for black Americans. But many white Americans openly and proudly discriminated against black people, creating unfair rules and treating them as second-class citizens in their communities. It would take several decades for society to become more racially integrated. In fact, some people still work to promote true racial equality in America today. While great strides were made in the 1860s and 70s, every step of the process was met with resistance, and those victories were hard won. Over time, people's attention shifted to other goals like women's rights, workers' rights, and temperance. Reconstruction was abandoned by society and the government. And what would this mean for black citizens? Today, we'll wrap up our Reconstruction Unit by focusing on these learning objectives. Describe the factors that led to the end of the Reconstruction era. Describe Redeemer governments and the New South. Describe Jim Crow laws and explain the importance of Plessy versus Ferguson. And identify the challenges faced by black Americans in the Jim Crow era. Now, as the Reconstruction era continued, a variety of factors began to undermine the progress that had been made. By the end of President Grant's second term, the public had lost confidence in the government because of several scandals. Treasury Department officials, custom agents, and even postmasters were caught accepting bribes to help gold sellers and whiskey distributors avoid paying taxes. The scandals didn't just look bad, they led to the Panic of 1873, a time when the economy struggled, businesses closed down, and many people had a hard time making ends meet. The panic caused many people to lose faith in President Grant and the Republican Party. The country had made important progress on racial equality by ratifying the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, but many struggling workers now turned their attention to the troubled economy. In the 1874 elections, Democrats won a majority of seats in the House of Representatives for the first time since before the Civil War. And the presidential election in 1876 was a nail-biter. Republicans shunned Grant after the scandals and economic downturn in favor of Rutherford B. Hayes. The election was tight. The vote count in a few key states was very close, and if Hayes won them all, he would win the election by just one electoral vote. In the end, the election was resolved by the Compromise of 1877, in which Democrats agreed to support Hayes as president, and Republicans agreed to remove the army from the South. Now, how do you think this compromise would impact Reconstruction efforts? The compromise showed the Republican Party was shifting its focus, becoming less committed to civil rights and equality for black Americans, marking the end of Reconstruction. Now, with Democrats in control of the House, Reconstruction came to a screeching halt. The removal of the army allowed Southern states to weaken civil rights for black people especially voting rights. A white supremacists formed the White League, seeking to promote white power to establish political dominance and to prevent black men from holding office. They monitored voters at polling stations to intimidate them. Now, this scared voters away from the polls because white leaguers often attacked people they saw casting ballots for Republican candidates. White supremacist tactics prevented many black people from voting and pushed white voters to support Democrats who opposed Reconstruction. Now, Confederate politicians and military leaders, grossly referring to themselves as redeemers, 
ran for office in the South. They wanted to reinforce white control and to further solidify the power of wealthy plantation owners, maintaining a society and economy similar to the pre-war era. Redeemer governments tried to undo what Reconstruction politicians had done by creating more black codes. They forced black workers back onto plantations under tightly controlled working conditions. Redeemers pulled funding from black schools, causing many to close and imposed unfair taxes targeting black citizens. But even facing oppression, some black students still got an education and many black businesses thrived. For example, Robert Church Sr., born into slavery, became a successful entrepreneur in Memphis, Tennessee. He founded Solvent Savings Bank, the first black owned bank in the United States and invested in infrastructure to rebuild Memphis after a devastating yellow fever epidemic. Church created cultural venues like Church Park and Auditorium, fostering a sense of pride and unity within the black community, showcasing its strength and resilience amidst the Redeemer government's attempts to strip black citizens of their rights and freedoms. The state government also invested in infrastructure and factories in cities like Atlanta, Memphis, Birmingham, and New Orleans helping the economy grow. Agriculture remained a vital part of the Southern economy, but manufacturing and trade became important too. The growth of railroads, telegraph lines, and later telephone lines also stimulated the economy. Over time, the New South, to a certain extent, began to resemble the North. White supremacy and laws that made it hard for black people to vote, such as literacy tests, poll taxes, and grandfather clauses, became especially widespread by the 1890s. Southern governments legally required racial segregation or separation in public places, beginning a period called the Jim Crow era. During this time, it was common for a black person to have to wait in a separate room at a doctor's office drink from a separate water fountain, or wait outside behind a restaurant for food because the owner wouldn't allow them to sit inside and eat with white patrons. In 1883, the Supreme Court ruled that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional, saying that the government could only control states, not individuals. But this allowed segregation to continue. The most infamous Supreme Court decision that reinforced segregation was Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. Homer Plessy, a mixed race man considered black by law, was arrested for sitting in a train car reserved for white passengers. In doing so, he had broken a Louisiana law requiring racial segregation on trains. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Louisiana, holding that segregation was constitutional if facilities were separate but equal. So in theory, if a school for white students existed, a school for black students should too, and they should be of equal quality. Now take a moment to pause the video and look at these two classrooms. Do these schools seem equal? Which would you have wanted to attend? In reality, separate facilities were never equal. Across both the North and the South, state governments underfunded black schools. This resulted in overcrowded classrooms with students of a variety of ages, outdated materials, and poorly maintained facilities. Meanwhile, white schools generally had access to better resources, including more qualified teachers, modern equipment, and well-maintained buildings, reflecting the systemic inequality and discrimination embedded in American society. In the Jim Crow era, most formerly enslaved people returned to working on farms owned by wealthy planters through tenant farming and sharecropping. Under contract, farmers rented land, grew crops, and gave a portion of their harvest to the landowner. Typically, a white landowner would take the largest share of the crops, leaving only a small amount for black farmers. Now, this sometimes indebted sharecroppers to the landowner, making it difficult to get out of their contract. What similarities do you notice between sharecropping and the slave system? Can this new economic system be considered true freedom?
This was not the future that many black families had hoped for back when Lincoln began Reconstruction. They faced Jim Crow laws and black codes, segregation, discrimination, and voter suppression, stripping away the promise of Reconstruction. Now, these laws and practices, along with violence from white leaguers and the Klan, created a system of oppression that persisted for decades. Now, that oppression limited the opportunities for black Americans and hurt their quality of life. Despite systemic oppression, black Americans continued to fight for their rights and dignity. Now, this struggle eventually led to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, which would lead to more legal and cultural changes in the post-war era. We'll learn about this later in our course, but for now, let's review. By the late 1870s, many Americans gave up the political fight Reconstruction had become. And because of scandal after scandal during the Grant administration, many people just didn't trust the government anymore. They focused on economic issues because of the Panic of 1873. As a result, the government removed the army from the South, allowing Redeemer governments in Southern states to roll back much of the work of Reconstruction. Southern governments, controlled by so-called redeemers, enacted black codes and Jim Crow laws, and the Supreme Court upheld them in Plessy v. Ferguson. This ushered in an era of segregation and discrimination for black Americans that lasted for nearly a century. The scars from that time are still with us, and understanding this period of history is crucial in recognizing its impact on our society today. And by learning from the past, we can work together to promote a more just and inclusive future. What do you think the future holds? And how can you play a role in shaping it? In our next unit, we'll be heading to the Wild West, which was growing and changing throughout the late 1800s as well. Until then, historians, remember, shaping the future begins with understanding the past. Hey, hey.